patients of the island's health facilities are in line for even greater customer service and more aesthetically appealing waiting areas because of the ministry's compassionate care program. On September 13, the Health Ministry launched its program at the Cornwall Regional Hospital's Accident and Emergency Unit. Black River Hospital will come and stream on September 20. Falmouth Hospital is slated for October. St. Anne's Bay and Savannah Lamar in November, while Port Antonio and Maypen will become operational in December. This is Jamaica Magazine. I'm Adrian Atkinson. Welcome. <music> This is my appeal, Jamaica. Give blood for it. Give blood and give the gift of life. So safe you don't have to think twice. For Do what you can for one another. Yeah, ma. Be a hero, be a blood donor. Yeah, yeah, me people. Watch it. Give blood. For your sister and your brother save the life of another. You might never know. Give blood. As you know my life, you love many people want blood. The father says so. One blood. Sign up to them. Be a blood donor. Many people want blood. Good day, I'm Stephen McHugh and this is your JIS News for Monday, September 17. By the end of October, commuters affected by the closure of the Three Miles Road in St. Andrew will get a new bypass road. Prime Minister Andrew Holness says the 1.4-kilometer two-lane road will be constructed on Chesterfield Drive off Spanish Town Road in the vicinity of Seaview Gardens. It will merge onto the recently upgraded Marcus Garvey Drive. A contract was signed with China Harbor Engineering Company this morning to build the road at a cost of one million U.S. dollars with funds from the major infrastructure development program. When that road is completed, there would be no need for commuters coming in to Kingston, heading downtown to be diverted through, for example, my constituency. Now they can turn onto Chesterfield, which would be the road right beside um, BNG Red Stripe, uh, which is a route, the road you would normally take into Seaview. But you would go down and then make a left onto the new road running alongside the, tra the, the train line. Work on the new road will include the installation of a Bailey Bridge and sewerage pipes, sidewalks, a bus bay, drains, and temporary traffic signals. Prime Minister Holness says the road, which is to run along a train line between Caymanus and the Kingston Wharves, will complement plans for the easy movement of goods from the wharf to the Caymanus Special Economic Zone. Because the intention is to continue that road directly to the southlands of the Caymanus uh, proposed Special Economic Zone. Mr. Holness also used this morning's press conference to make a public apology to those inconvenienced by the ongoing roadworks across the corporate area. I want the Jamaican people to know that your government is listening, your government cares, and your government will do what is necessary to ensure that while we are progressing, you know, we are not hurting in the interim. So pardon our progress, but please remember your government cares and is working in your behalf. The importation, manufacturing, distribution and usage of single-use plastic carrier bags, plastic straws and styrofoam containers will be banned starting January 1, 2019. Minister without portfolio in the Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation, Darrell Vaz, made the announcement this morning. The ban will not apply to bags over the 24 by 24 inch dimension or those used to maintain public health and food standards. The National Environment and Planning Agency, NEPA, will also consider exemptions for manufacturers on a case-by-case -case basis up to January 1, 2021. In the meantime, Minister Vaz says the Development Bank of Jamaica and the Exim Bank will create mechanisms for manufacturers to retool and configure their businesses to meet the new standards. Consultations on the proposed implementation of a national deposit refund scheme for pet bottles is far advanced, with an announcement to be made by the end of October. And a comprehensive public education campaign, complete with a hotline, is to be launched to bolster the National Deposit Refund Scheme. Local manufacturers and distributors are encouraged to make available environmentally friendly goods for the domestic market. Similarly, I urge consumers to be mindful of their level of consumption of goods which have a negative impact on our environment 
and seek to purchase those goods which are beneficial to the environment and by extension the health and well-being of your, both yourself and your families. A 24-hour mental health or suicide helpline will be established by the Ministry of Health. The ministry is partnering with the non-governmental organization Choose Life International, CLI, to set up and manage the toll-free helpline 1-888-NEW-LIFE or 1-888-639-5433. Health Minister Dr. Christopher Tufton provided details at a CLI World Suicide Prevention Day seminar on Friday. He said the new helpline would consolidate and replace several lines in the Ministry of Health, as well as a similar service offered by Choose Life International. We want to formalize that relationship and establish this line. And the idea is to stabilize those who are so vulnerable in the immediacy of the situation but then use the public health system with all the critical technocrats and infrastructure to do a lot of the follow-up post-stabilization. According to the 2016-2017 Jamaica Health and Lifestyle Survey, depression is one of the main predisposition factors to suicide. The survey suggested that the national estimate of the prevalence of depression was 14.3%. Meanwhile, there are 20,000 patients on register in the adult mental health clinics and 3,500 in child guidance clinics. To address these realities, Dr. Tufton says his ministry is engaged in several initiatives to address the issue of suicide. These include plans to launch a national campaign in the coming months to educate and inform the public around issues of mental health. The Jamaica Constabulary Force, JCF, will be engaging approximately 150 primary, secondary and private schools on the signs of gang involvement, how to treat with such issues and diversion strategies. The sessions will be held on September 18, targeting students, parents and school administrators and are part of the JCF's Anti-Gang Week campaign. The week is being observed from September 16 to 21 under the theme, Gang Life Equals No Life. I think. The objective of this week is not just to, for PR purposes, but to awaken the consciousness of people to say that you need to get involved. Our youth, our young people are exposed. And if we want a better Jamaica, everyone must get involved. The sessions will take place in collaboration with the Ministry of Education's Safe School Program. We have already trained our deans of discipline in all our high schools and several other administrators in safety and security and many of our schools. In some cases we have over 90% of our schools with compliance in establishing safety and security committees. Assistant Superintendent of Police Minto and before him SSP Bailey were addressing a JIS think tank recently. Anti-Gang Week will also engage wards of the state in juvenile correction centers on Wednesday. Other activities include a public meeting in Mandela Park on Thursday, as well as a cultural entertainment session on Friday at the Halfway Tree Transport Center. And finally, the country will continue to experience rainfall into Tuesday as Tropical Storm Isaac passes south of the island. According to the Meteorological Service of Jamaica, Isaac will continue to produce periods of showers and thunderstorms across most parishes. Gusty winds are also expected along coastal areas, prompting the Met Office to issue a small craft warning for inshore and offshore areas of the north and south coasts. And that's it for GIS News Today. I'm Stephen McHugh. Thanks for watching. Three Miles is one of the country's busiest intersections with 70,000 vehicles passing through the area daily, and it's now experiencing roadwork improvements. Motorists and pedestrians are being asked to follow simple road rules as they traverse the Three Miles area and any other road construction zones in the country. Remember, the prescribed speed limit is 30 km per hour. Adhere to the instructions of the flag persons in these areas. Always look out for posted warning signs. Expect delays. Plan for them by leaving early to reach your destination on time. And finally, slow down and be aware of your environment. The development of the Three Miles Road Network is just another example of our government working to make Jamaica the place of choice. It's all around us. It influences how we work, learn, live, play and plan for the future.
GIS is the short form of Geographic Information System. It's a computer-based system built to capture, store, manipulate, analyze, manage, and display all kinds of spatial or geographical data. In geography class in high school, persons were taught that in geography, we're able to locate where features are using coordinates. That's the basis of GIS, knowing where these features are on the Earth's surface and being able to represent that within a computer-based environment where that is seen visually. So it's a support tool that we use to provide additional um, extension to any business process. And with this GIS technology, the government has been mapping Jamaica's course on the information highway. Leading that charge is the Land Information Council of Jamaica, LICJ, a mandate held since 1992. Jamaica is considered the leading country within the English-speaking Caribbean with regards to GIS. We're able to provide direction, policy development. In addition to coordinating the implementation of a national land information policy strategy, the LICJ has also been instrumental in developing a national GIS network. And with the foundation set, the Council is now focused on establishing and implementing a National Spatial Data Infrastructure, NSDI. Through that infrastructure, government will be able to capture, manage, maintain, integrate, discover and distribute spatial data at all levels of society. The LICJ's mandate is executed through its Secretariat, the National Spatial Data Management Division, NSDMD. We provide a lot of technical support to all of these various government agencies that actively use GIS to carry out their mandate. We train these persons. Apart from that, we facilitate conducting GIS needs assessments. Government is currently the largest user of geospatial and related technologies, and that usage runs throughout government. It's seen in the water sector, transport, disaster management, environment management, national security, education, health, and agriculture. But no other area has seen the proliferation of GIS technology than that of land use and development. At the Urban Development Corporation, GIS is used to streamline operations in various departments, including estate management, business development, architecture, and corporate security. We are on the road now to our 50th anniversary, and uh, we see GIS as being that enabling tool to provide UDC you now with not just the way to make better decisions in development, but also improving UDC's image as a modern entity. The same is true for the National Land Agency's land titling, land valuation, surveys and mapping, and estate management divisions. A lot of the business processes that exist within the different uh, divisions have GIS tied into it. So for example, there is no way that somebody can, at present, um, acquire a new certificate of title without some work happening on the GIS end. The National Works Agency also uses GIS in project planning, land acquisition and location analysis. Everything that we do has a spatial component to it and it's hard to deny that GIS is going to play a role in all of that. Cost savings, greater efficiency, faster decision making, Improved communication and better record keeping are all derived from the use of GIS. And the private sector also has been getting in on the technology. Increasing GIS nationwide is also a focus for the LICJ and the NSDMD. To facilitate this, the government has signed an enterprise license agreement with the Environmental Research Institute. That agreement has been a game changer. It has allowed us to be more efficient, you know, in terms of accessing the data and um, using it to provide more information and to engage also with the public as well. What it does is open up a whole new world. So there are almost no limits to what we can do with GIS and improving the way we handle our spatial data as a government. Public awareness has also been heightened with the GIS Day during Geography Awareness in November. That observation has been staged annually since 2003. In 2017, with the LICJ celebrating 25 years groundbreaking work, there will be a two-day GIS user conference in October. The conference will focus on national security for sustainable development under the theme, Geospatial Technologies, Mapping Our Way to Secure Communities. 
As we strive to learn more about each other and the world around us, there is no doubt that GIS is the most practical and beneficial tool in this process. As Jack Dangamond, co-founder of the Environmental Systems Research Institute said, GIS is waking up the world to the power of geography, the science of integration and has the framework for creating a better future. We invite you to learn more about the GIS User Conference by visiting the webpage at gisuserconferenceja.com. This is the Aedes aegypti mosquito that spreads the Zika, Chikungunya, and Dengue viruses. Search for its breeding sites and destroy them. A message from the Ministry of Health. The Ministry of Health has stepped up its vector control activities to minimize the spread of mosquito-borne diseases. 560 community health aides are being trained to assist public health vector control officers. Under the second phase of the Ministry of Health and HOPE program partnership, 130 vector control aides are also being engaged. While government is doing its part, check this next feature to see what you can do to rid your communities of mosquito breeding sites. We're looking for any container or anything which can hold water. It doesn't need a lot of water for that mosquito to deposit its eggs. Um, very shallow quantity of water they can deposit in. The rain has fallen and this has collected water. And if it is allowed to sit in the environment for a couple of days, the Aedes aegypti will breed on it. This is a plastic over a pail and the water is in the, on the plastic. This is a beautiful breeding site for the Aedes aegypti mosquito. We have a similar one right here. There's water on the top of this container and the Aedes aegypti mosquito will breed in it. Once the water begins to evaporate and she has a space to lay her eggs, she will lay her eggs and this will then become a breeding site. Turn it over. We do appreciate that roof gutters are very necessary in some areas that do not have pipe water, so it helps to collect the rainwater when it comes. However, if these roof drains become blocked by trash or other things, then it makes the water stagnant and it becomes a major breeding site for the Aedes aegypti mosquito. So it's important if you have these roof gutters that you keep them clear that the water is able to run. Even among your plants, we have plants that are, because of how the leaves overlap each other, they are able to collect water. And Aedes aegypti loves to breed in those environments. We suggest that persons do. If you think you love these plants and you want them, put them in pots. So when they do collect water, it's able to, you're able to pick up the pots, drain them out and put them down. Because as it is right now, it's very difficult for us to get rid of the water and they will just continue to be in the environment as breeding sites. This is a tile which has been discarded, but it's just in the backyard. And what we have now is apparently rainwater has now settled inside there and we have it breeding. The ADs are back to the breeding inside here. It can be used as an enclosure for your plants, like a potted plant situation. So what we'll show you now is how we can have it filled with dirt that will ensure that when rain does fall, mosquito will not breed in it. There's also a method of stacking the tires so that they will not collect water. We advise the tire shop owners to, for each tire that they get to punch a hole in each of the tires. Once that is done, they can stock them in this platting form. So they have one row going in a particular direction and then another set going in the opposite direction and they will continue with this. What this does, it allows the water to be directed towards where the hole is bored. So even if the rain comes and water goes in, the water will not settle but go out. We know that most churches have what is called a baptismal pool. And we have found baptismal pools to be a major breeding site for the Aedes aegypti mosquito. So what is it that churches should do? 
we recommend that all baptismal pools be covered properly so that the mosquito will not have access to it for breeding. Sometimes the pools are shaped very funny and so it's very difficult to cover. In those instances, we ask persons to empty the pool at least once per week. And after emptying the pool, we ask that you scrub the sides to ensure that you have dislodged all the eggs. So we saw many sites that were breeding the Aedes aegypti mosquito today. And we saw that these sites were found in and around our homes, business places. And if we do not deal with these breeding sites, they are going to continue to be there, posing a risk for the transmission of diseases because they are breeding the Aedes aegypti the mosquito. So you must take action to rid your environment of those sites. So what is it that we're asking you to do? We want you to make this a habit. Once a week, search for and destroy the breeding sites of the Aedes aegypti mosquito. We have a subculture that supports those who do not inform, an anti-informer culture that pervades our entire society that we must break down. Heritage Month is two weeks away, and we want to get you in the mood for visiting some of our historical sites. But have you ever wondered how well-preserved some of the artifacts at and from these sites are? Get the details on one of the procedures. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Headquarters House, home of the Jamaica National Heritage Trust. We're going to take you through some of the ropes in the methods in conservation, so please come along with us. Thanks for joining us in our conservation lab. You, we have here working with us Mr. Darrington Ferguson as well as Mr. Frank Gale and we'll be looking at some of the methods they will be applying to different material types for the preservation of our material culture of Jamaica. First of all, we have here some cannonballs that are usually found with some extent of corrosion. Mr. Ferguson is actually removing mechanically some of the concretion from a cannonball and after he has removed that then we would wire it this wired metal object would then we would then install in our elect electrolytic tank in the it's process of electrolysis what we are actually doing we are primarily reversing the process of corrosion once it has been electrolyzed it would look something like this so we would then proceed to brush to remove any loose rust that would be left on it. We would then put the iron object in some pure water, which we call deionized water, and that would be heated to ensure that the metal itself would facilitate the extraction of any impurities that might be left in the body of the iron. After that, we would dry the iron object. Most times we dry it in alcohol and that would remove the water from the body of the object. And after drying, we would take a substance we call tannic acid, um, applying several coats and it would form somewhat a stable surface for the iron object. And then the final stage is waxing to provide a coating or a lacquer on the surface of the iron object. Here we have Mr. Gale, he's actually applying orthophosphoric acid to remove slight rusting or um, corrosion from the case of a sword. He is actually um, using what we call a chemical as well as a mechanical means of so doing. We have close to it the extractor system which is used to remove harmful fumes from the atmosphere in order to make the environment a much healthier one in which and a safer one for us to work. Lead 
corrodes by forming mainly lead sulfite and lead carbonate. So we would be soaking it first of all in ammonium acetate and that would basically remove within a few hours the lead carbonate. In order to remove the, any residue of ammonium acetate that might be left on the lead, we would then rinse it quickly for a short time period, just rinse it in a bath of a very dilute solution of um, hydrochloric acid. If there are any corrosion left at that stage, then we would remove that mechanically, either with a, very likely with a glass bristle brush. After that, we do as we would with the iron. Coming over here now, we have copper or copper material. We have been soaking this copper in um, a substance we prepare in the lab, which we call alkaline rochelle salt. The alkaline rochelle salt will remove from it largely the what we call bronze disease. So we use, we soak it in the solution. The chemi chemical will dissolve the um, bronze disease. After that has been dissolved, then we would rinse in, for example, a dilute solution of sulfuric acid to remove any slight impurities or corrosion product that might be left there. After that, we will, as we do with the other metals, Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you were well informed by the information we've imparted today and you're welcome to join us at any time, particularly at our heritage sites. And when you see our heritage sites, you see the artifacts that are there, you will appreciate to a greater extent the effort that has gone in to its preservation. Some quick tips on breastfeeding for mommy. Mommy, so eat from all the seven food groups that keep you healthy. Continue taking your maternal supplements. Remember, baby is getting all its nutrients from breastfeed milk. And make sure that when baby sleeps, you sleep, because babies don't have a special time to sleep. So you have to get rest when baby sleeps. So you need some home help, mommy. And that is, please to try your best to help mommy. If you can't get someone to come and stay at mommy, daddies can provide the food and parcel it out so that mommy don't have to go in the kitchen and cook. And daddy has to work, and we know that not all workplaces provide paternal leave. So daddy can also help mommy with putting baby onto the breast, and daddy, when mommy express or daddy express, daddy can cup feed the baby while mommy is sleeping. So this will encourage mommy to get some rest. And daddy can help mommy with changing the diaper and walking the baby and allowing mommy some time for rest. Because rest is very important for mommy to recuperate while caring for baby. And that's how we close out Jamaica Magazine on this station. We are available at your leisure on jis.gov.jm or on all the major social media platforms. You may also download our mobile app that's Android and iOS compatible. On behalf of the entire team here at the JIS, I'm Adrian Atkinson. Thanks for watching. This has been a production of the Jamaica Information Service, the voice of Jamaica.